senior counsel Paul Mwite, who in his uh, to take the lead in arguing this point. Uh, allow me to begin by juxtaposing three constitutional provisions and pose the challenge that I will ask my lords to retire with for purposes of uh, our your, your consideration. The first is Article 141, Clause 1 of the Constitution. Article 141, Clause 1 of the Constitution provides an agreement that the swearing in of the president elect shall be in public before the chief justice or in the absence of the chief justice, the deputy chief justice. It's very clear. It says who must do and what will happen in the of that person. Article 148, clause 4 of the Constitution provides, and I quote, the swearing in of the deputy president elect shall be before the chief justice or in the absence of the chief justice, the deputy chief justice. And in fact, another very clear stipulation of our constitution of what the chief justice can do and it will happen in the absence of the chief justice. Then we go to Article 165, Clause 4. I'm my lord, my lady. You notice that Article 141, Clause 4, Article 148, Clause 4, come before Article 165, Clause 4. The makers of the Constitution were aware of what would happen in the absence of the Chief Justice while drafting Article 141, Clause 1, Article 148, Clause 4. Let us see what they said at Article 165, Clause 4. They say in the report that any matter certified by the court as raising a substantial question of law under clause 3 B or D shall be heard by an, an even number of judges, being not less than three, assigned by the Chief Justice. Full stop. I, I'm, I'm always encouraged by an article of my mentor, Professor Gizmo Egai, not many years ago, called Political Jurisprudence or Neutral Principles. Another look at the problem of question of interpretation. <coughs> and Professor Gizmo Egai makes an important argument that decisions of question of courts must be formulable in such a manner that they would apply coherently to all subsequent cases of similar facts. I will not read these names in full, but you now know that if we approach this court and read for it Lena Conchella, the decision already alluded to, it will appear that this court's position is this power by the Chief Justice is administrative. If we approach this court and read the case of Kemri and the case of Montata, both of which have been referred to by my learned colleague Mr. Gada, you will notice that the power under Article 165 is not administrative. The court says so. And my Lord and Urima, you contribute that experience. It is a constitutional imperative. I think my teacher, Professor Guido Mega, will frown at that in jurisprudence as being political jurisprudence, because then we cannot answer first year law student coherently. Is it administrative or is it not? We will find it difficult to answer it. Fortunately for you, as judges sitting here, you are not bound by those previous decisions, and you must come to the correct interpretation of the law in a manner that would address similar cases in the future coherently and without subjecting the judiciary to possible uh, embarrassment. So then you have to go and read what the two cases say, Kemri and Oktata, cultural imperative, and what Conchella says, administrative. But then you look at the eventual verdict in Conchella, even when they say it's administrative, they set out the preconditions for that. And the question you want to answer is this, my lords, have those preconditions even been met, assuming even that you take it by administrative, for the deputy chief justice 
Twitter have the tools of constituting a bench? Because that's a limited question that we are here to address and to guide this court. I make an argument that none of those grounds has been met. For example, we sat in this court in the morning, and I know this question will arise subsequently when we deal with the application for recusal, where my lord say, no, you know, in the virtual courts, in the virtual system, we can sit on anywhere. We, I, I'm trying to paraphrase it, my lord, so if I, if I get one word wrong, uh, it's not for any intention. We can sit at any time. We can sit from anywhere. We can sit on any day. So that, can the Chief Justice, for example, be virtually absent? Is it possible that the Chief Justice of Kenya distinguishes herself as the first person to be absent virtually? Whatever she is at home, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia, in Kenya, whatever it is, can she be absent virtually? The answer is a emphatic no. That in the virtual space, it is difficult to justify absence. Is the Chief Justice disabled? At least, it has not been suggested by the applicant, nor the respondent, that the Chief Justice is disabled. And therefore, even looking at the Conchella decision, none of the preconditions cited there to justify the limb of administrative has been met. In which case, the Deputy Chief Justice has no basis upon which she could have taken up the charges to constitute this bench. In a virtual court, my lords, and we must be very careful about this because I, I kept asking myself this morning, I, I've never been a judge, maybe one day I will be, maybe not, how uncomfortable <laughs> it would be to sit as a judge when you perceive that some of the parties believe are uncomfortable with you. It, it must be a very frustrating situation to find oneself in, and, and, and my sympathies go out all judges who find themselves in those circumstances. That's why I'm using this argument. But the interface between litigants and the judiciary in this technology space is the CTS, the e filing system. There are no directions from the Deputy Chief Justice in the, in the e filing system that we are interacting with. None whatsoever. Is the judiciary immune from the principle of transparency and accountability? It is not. If the Deputy Chief Justice makes such a consequential move, as taking up the powers vested expressly in the Chief Justice. That's a matter she must, number one, expressly disclose by lodging it in the CTS for us to interact with. Number two, provide reasons for taking up that role in that direction. We ought to have seen a decision saying, for the following reasons I take up this role of the Chief Justice, then proceed to give direction. In the absence of that, step, my lord, you have stood up as individual judges, as some of the greatest defenders of our constitution. That character you have established in the past demands, that you look at the deputy judges in the eye and say, you may have been well intentioned. You are. You fell short of the question of standard, and therefore by virtue of Article 2 of the constitution, what you did was null and void. Our seating, the three of us at this bench, is null and void. We must down our tools at that juncture. And I would invite my senior colleagues in your council to carry forward and finish our business. And thank you so much. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Honorable Judge. The taking of the court file 015 from Kerenyaga court in the middle of the night was a gross irregularity that impacts on a fair trial. The bringing of that file in the middle of the night from Kerugoya, presumably the deputy chief judge 